instead we've got a hard stop at 11. So please join me in welcoming our keynote, Carthy Price. Hi everyone, great to see so many people in the flesh and great to also know that there's an audience online. I'm thrilled to be here, thanks to MCG for inviting me. So, um, I have been, I've got to do a double clicking thing here because I've got some notes as well, so let me line up my fingers. Um, I've been invited here, as Daph said, to do a bit of a reflection over the last two and a half years and the impact that COVID uh, has had on us all, amongst other things, the impact it's had on museums and the wider cultural sector. But let's face it, there might be uh, other things you'd rather talk about right now. I could just summarise it's uh, been more than a little bit shit. Um, I could just stop now and say, should we just have a group hug? Uh, should we just have a mass primal screening session instead? It might be beneficial for us all. Which would you prefer? Um, but I'm assuming that in the next 40 minutes or so, um, I will do a bit of reflection and then I'm going to pose a bunch of questions to you. And I don't necessarily have the answers to those questions, but I think it will be a good collective exercise to mull over them together. Mostly what I'm going to tell you probably won't be new to you. Um, lots of it is a review of what we've all been through together. And it touches on what we're doing, uh, what we've been through individually, what we've been through collectively. Um, what changed temporarily, what changed for good, and what are the, some of the things that we actually might want to keep hold of that we uh, faced into over the last two and a half years. So, let's get our brains in gear. I'm going to start off with a bit of maths. Here are five simple questions for you. The quick look is not going. There we go. Here are five questions for you, set by the maths guru, Bobby Seagull. Can you have a read, please? There are five questions. Just have a little canter through those. I'm going to give you some time, and any latecomers, to sit down and have a mull of some maths questions. Now, I'd like you to be really honest here. Hands up if you think you could answer all five questions. <laughs> In about five minutes. Could we answer something right? Yeah, <laughs> answer correctly. I meant to say correctly. Hands up if you think you could do all five questions. Excellent. We've got five people in the room that could answer five questions. I don't know about the at-home audience and if you're a bit more math savvy. Thank you for being honest. What about feeling confident at about three? Hands up if you think you could do at least three. Okay. Yep, a, a bit, bit more. What about, um, but thank you for your honesty. What about you think you can manage two but not more? Excellent, thank you. The one person that put their hand up. Well, <laughs> um, the answers are there below. And apparently 56% uh, of, of UK adults would only be able to answer two or fewer questions correctly. So this audience skews um, towards a slightly more maths competent um, side of things. But this is the equivalent of what we'd expect a primary school age kid to know. And in March 2022, sorry, March 2020, the parents among us suddenly became home homeschoolers and were expected to know the answers to stuff like this. So cue a massive spike in Google Trends search results for things like Pythagoras' the theorem and long division. And I should know because I was one of them. Because suddenly we weren't just folk working in museums and galleries and agencies. We were suddenly homeschoolers. We were carers. We were pub quiz hosts. We were online party entertainers. We were sourdough starter nurturers. Suddenly, there are a lot of jobs, an awful lot of jobs to do alongside the day job. It's hard to summarise the massive socio-political shifts we've experienced since spring 2020. George Floyd was murdered. We saw the Black Lives Matter movement gaining massive traction. We saw statues falling. We saw government's response to statues falling. And we saw the rise of social activism in our institutions. <coughs> We also saw cultural organisations struggle in their response to anti-racism and broader debates around decolonisation. So as we know too well, we experience this massive shift in the context in which we work 
and live. And that shift had a lot of consequences. Some good, some bad, some temporary, some permanent. And I'm going to be talking about four sets of consequences around collaboration, around content, around cash, and around churn. Obviously, there were many more consequences, and I've just chosen these four, mainly because they uh, are alliterative, or at least they start with the letter C. So there were consequences for how we collaborate with one another to do the jobs we do. There were consequences for the kinds of content and products that we make. There were consequences for how much cash our organisations had, a lot less, basically. And we experienced a lot of churn, not just emotional churn, but staff churn. And I know that's a pretty terrible term, but it starts with a C, so forgive me. And we're now seeing the effect of the pandemic in us losing lots of brilliant and talented people from our institutions. So to start, one big consequence of the pandemic was around collaboration, particularly because very suddenly we had to start turning our bedrooms and our kitchen tables into desk spaces, sorry, office spaces for remote working, which made collaboration, well, a bit different. It's a truism that all museums and cultural organisations operate in silos, and I think that's certainly not always the case. But there are definitely physical impediments, things like 15, 20 minute walks across buildings to meet with someone just for a simple meeting. And there are most definitely cultural impediments that make it hard to collaborate sometimes. So we had to adapt really quickly to home working and to remote collaboration. Some of us already had the tools, but some didn't. I remember a curator friend of mine the week before lockdown saying, MS Teams, what's MS Teams? Uh, little did she know how intimately acquainted she'd become with the tool. So soon we saw a more widespread adoption of tools and that we were already using, uh, things like shared content planners in Trello, as well as us adopting newer tools like Miro. Ultimately, it meant we had to find new ways of working and quickly. And I think we saw better, more effective communication, both within and between teams. But it wasn't always easy. Because, as we know, digital teams were faced with a hosepipe of demands and requests from right across the organisation. Often, the ask was around making things that normally happen in physical spaces, things in lecture theatres like this, and things in exhibitions, happen online. All rise the online exhibition. Now, I'm not a fan of simply transposing physical paradigms, things like exhibitions and displays, to putting them online. That's not the way digital works. It's not the way good digital thinking works. Instead, we should be thinking about how best to tell stories, how to package them up as great content, great experiences online. And that generally means not just whacking up an online gallery or an exhibition. So managing that surge in incoming risked digital teams saying no an awful lot and learning how to say no in new and very polite ways. We polished our skills at refining the ask of all these inbound requests. Success was there, for example, for us at the VNA, helping colleagues in the VNA Academy team do a massive pivot to take the paid for learning offer online. That work involved a lot of collaboration, and it couldn't have happened without these new ways of working. But it wasn't always easy. Sometimes we just had to let things go bite the bullet and help, pull, pull, help teams to pop stuff up online that we knew wouldn't necessarily fly with our audiences online. When it worked best, it was because we had a shared, a more singular purpose, and that was to drive online engagement. When the doors of our institutions are open, we have so many competing demands for digital teams to create content, products and experience that drive visits, sell tickets, sell memberships, drive donations, promote learning, promote events, provide information. There's a lot to do. Instead, during the lockdown, we just had one thing to focus on, audience engagement online. In many ways, it became a lot simpler. And to do that, we pulled together collectively to work toward that end. We became a lot more joined up across teams, across digital, marketing, comms, membership, learning teams, we began an approach to planning and aligning our channels much more towards clearer goals and targets. And that's stuck. And that's been one of the most positive things to come out of the last couple of years. 
On to our next consequence, that of making content and making content that people want. And just to make it super clear, I'm sure lots of us, if not all, were already making content that people want. That was the thing. We already had bags of great content, but we saw a lot of demand internally to make more content, to make new content. And that demand wasn't just from above, it was from right across the organization, the call for new stuff. So a lot of time was spent reminding people just how much great content we already had and focusing our effort instead on shining a light on that content, making it more visible to our audiences. This meant putting more focus on channel activity and alignment to drive more people to that existing content rather than just simply making more. In early March 2020, it dawned on us that it was likely that the museum was going to close soon. Just as our exhibition Kimono, Kyoto to Catwalk opened. So the content team at the VNA worked rapidly with our curator Anna Jackson to storyboard and capture a series of five films that told some of the stories behind this incredible show. It was an opportunistic moment and it really paid off moving rapidly and quickly to mobilise a team across a bunch of different functions to create this content. And it was quite a feat to pull off, creating such quality content just as the doors were closing. We then released these films to our first to our members and then to the wider general public, and they've now garnered over half a million views online. It was an added bonus for the team to receive a Time Out, Time In Award for the best digital art experience for these films. Interestingly, they're not an art online exhibition. They're not a 3D rendered walkthrough of a, a gallery space. They're not using new technology. They're just really well-crafted films that do a brilliant job of storytelling and continue to drive lots of engagement today. I should add here that this example and those to follow are all down to the v &A's amazing content team headed up by Tom Windross. So our understanding of audience behaviours deepened as we took an even more data-informed approach to content development. We developed new formats, like our successful ASMR series. ASMR, for those who don't know, stands for Autosensory Meridian Response, basically those who have it get a pleasant tingling sensation when they hear certain sounds and, and noises, um, particularly sort of high fidelity sounds. So we built a series of content, a new format around what is actually a massive online community of ASMR enthusiasts. This series delves into the V&A's collections, exploring the sounds involved in the care and conservation of objects like Charlie Chaplin's hat, or a dress worn by PJ Harvey, or this sequined clown costume. It's a format that's loved not just by the ASMR community online, who are lapping up the content we release regularly, but also millions of others on YouTube and across social. We've continued to invest a lot of time in developing and refining this format, led by the brilliant Hannah Kingwell on our team, with sound artist Julie Rose Bauer, and colleagues from across the museum. It's really shown us the benefit of format thinking as a way to give audiences reasons to subscribe and reasons to keep coming back. And if you're interested in hearing more about the importance of formats, do check out Matt Locke from Story Things talking to Ashman on the Digital Works podcast. It's a really brilliant episode. What we found out by delving into audience behaviour online during the pandemic was that people were moving towards the ends, the extreme ends of a number of spectrums. We hear a lot about the dwindling uh, appetites and attention spans of online audiences, that they're only interested in the 10 second TikTok. It's true, they love a good TikTok, and this is a particularly good one, made by a talented social team. But online audiences are also very happy to watch, as we found out, a 40 minute video about how to paint a pomegranate in watercolor. This video, launched in December 2020, has been watched over 260,000 times. But what's more interesting is that it ranks as one of our highest performing pieces of content in terms of the number of people, the proportion of people watching till the end. In fact, 20% of people get to the end of this video. That's an incredible statistic for a 40 minute video. And what's interesting is that most people watching this video are under 34. It says a lot about there still being an appetite for well-executed long form content. 
If you're interested in learning more about this, do check out my colleague Joe Jones's brilliant piece on the cultural content substack, and I'll put out links after the talk for all of these things. So during the pandemic, we also saw our audience tastes moving towards either end of another spectrum. They were loving the online interactives our team created to support the refurbishment of the Raphael Courts. You can talk to Richard uh, Palmer, who's in the room, um, or colleagues online about all the technical complexity of creating these brilliant online interactives. But they were based on some incredible new imaging and photography done by Factum Arte of the Raphael cartoons. Those are the preparatory sketches that Raphael and team did for the tapestries that hang in the Vatican Sistine Chapel. Again, we saw a huge uptick in engagement and in dwell times for this in-depth, informative content that gave our audiences lots of agency into exactly how and where they saw these incredible images. At the same time, people were just craving a bit of fun and time-killing entertainment. Cue Designer Whip, an online interactive that gives people the chance to make their own 18th century Marie Antoinette style crazy wig, complete with feathers, galleons and flags. Originally, we did see a surge uh, through some rude interpretations <laughs> online through a whole Reddit forum that drove a lot of traffic. But people in the lockdown were really interested in just doing this. It's a mindful form of, just a mindless and mindful form of entertainment. They wanted a relief from all that homeschooling and banana bread making. So was this just a lockdown audience behaviour? I think the answer is no. We found these behaviours look like they're here to stay, and they've informed the way we commission content. It's good to think of publishing content, pushing content commissioning around the ends of these various spectrums that are at play. So on to the next section. The big question for us is how do we keep making good content, good products and good experiences when there's less cash to do that with? What do we do when faced with a sudden drop of income and funding that happened during the pandemic? So, as visitor attractions, we are utterly reliant on visitors. And then, suddenly, there were none. No tourists, no <coughs> domestic visitors. And even when things opened up, numbers were down and continue to be down. Tourists haven't returned in their form of the numbers, but we've also seen that UK visitors have also changed their visiting behaviours. The challenge is that museum business models are still utterly reliant on people coming to our buildings, and spending money when they're there. Across the board, we fail to develop business models that move us away from this reliance on visitors and visitation. So organisations have had to think differently around funding opportunities. Some organisations were able to benefit from emergency funding from government via the Cultural Recovery Fund and other initiatives, a much needed band-aid, but that only got us so far. We've had to think about new business models and to think about how to build up, for example, membership propositions that are less reliant on nice spaces and free access to exhibitions and physical spaces. And this has put a big pressure on digital teams, among others, to think about new ways for digital things, digital products, channels and content to make money. Over the pandemic, there were some interesting initiatives and experiments around how to monetize content, for example, but I'm not sure that any of us landed solid new digital revenue streams. At the end of today's conference, Chris Unit is going to be uh, taking us through some ideas with the panel on what the data tells us about how organisations will be funding digital activity, and that promises to be a really interesting session. No doubt, the future funding landscape will be even more reliant on partnerships. At the v we were really lucky to be approached by HTC Vive Arts to partner on our Alice in Wonderland exhibition. Together with Preloaded, we developed a VR experience for the exhibition that invited visitors to step into Alice's shoes and to go down the rabbit hole to play an impossible game of hedgehog croquet. We actually began development the month before lockdown, and it soon dawned on us it would be a very long time before any exhibition visitors would ever encounter the VR experience. Who knew when we'd be able to finally open the exhibition? So we created an extended and paid for version of the VR experience called Curious Alice for the at-home audience. 
It was a brilliant opportunity and one we simply wouldn't have been able to do without HTC's generous investment. And it's increasingly likely, I think, that commercial partnerships will be the preferred model to support any innovative developments digitally within the sector. And on to the last section, churn. It's a terrible term, as I said before, but one that speaks to the fact that we've lost some really good people from our sector, from our institutions, and from our teams. So in a recent podcast episode I recorded with Ashland's uh, Digital Works podcast, second plug, Ash, I might have inadvertently suggested that a bunch of folks, looking at you, Daph, might have been prompted to leave their roles in the cultural sector because of the power of Beyonce's Summer 22 hit, Break My Soul. Bay captured a moment, a moment where we were all feeling overworked, underappreciated, and not in control of our destinies. She encouraged us to divest from all that was no longer serving us and instead invest our energies into something more nourishing. That moment, as we all know, has been dubbed the Great Resignation, a moment that saw people across the globe quitting their jobs as they re-evaluate what they want from work in the wake of the pandemic. The Great Resignation started in 2020, and it continues in 2022, and it's affecting our sector, it's affecting my team. One of the most worrying consequences of these recent shifts is the brain, day, brain drain on the cultural sector, and I fear the brain drain is set to continue, particularly as it's hard to attract new talent into the sector, given the struggles we have in remunerating people at a level that's in any way competitive to other sectors. <coughs> And alongside people choosing to leave the sector and pursue new roles elsewhere, many organisations have had to make big staff cuts. The financially precarious situation our institutions found ourselves, themselves in led to restructures large scale and small. And this has had a massive impact on the work that we do. Digital teams usually have a core storytelling function and that storytelling is a collective exercise one that involves experts and ideas from across our organisations. Suddenly we found many of our internal experts were no longer there. And digital teams themselves were hit too, with, if we were lucky, vacancy freezes, and worse still, some of us were faced with making roles redundant, at a time when digital roles felt more relevant and more necessary than ever. This raises a bunch of difficult questions that we'll come on to shortly, like, who's left to do all this work? Who decides? Who, who, what are we not going to do if there are fewer people to do the work? And who decides? Do we end up outsourcing if there aren't internal <coughs> digital specialists? And do we even have budget to do that? And now the UK is facing its longest, record, its longest recession since records began. And it's expected that that recession is going to head well into 2024. We can but assume there are more cuts to come. So how can we anticipate what the size and shape of the new digital team should look like in this new era? It's really important to acknowledge that it's been hard. It's been super hard for all of us. And it's hard when you lo lose good colleagues and team members through restructures, as well as the people who choose to move on. It's hard for those who lose her their roles, and it's hard for those of us who are left to continue bearing the emotional and mental labour involved in the digital work in this sector. Emotional labour is a term that gained much more traction over the course of the pandemic. It's a term that covers balancing career, issue, career with caring responsibilities. It straddles employment rights, employee experience. It covers stress and burnout. Digital work inevitably involves emotional labour, particularly at a time when there was such a focus and reliance on the work of digital teams. I'd encourage you to listen to Dr. Sophie Frost's People Change Museums podcast, one of the outputs of the brilliant one-by-one -one research programme which I've been involved in. There's an episode on the very topic of emotional labour and it's really a, a one to listen to. Because ultimately, we are all a bit burnt out. Our emotional reserves are at an all-time low. And those who've continued to work throughout the pandemic making brilliant content and brilliant digital products are running on empty. It's so important those of us in leadership positions find whatever support we can to make sure our people can replenish those reserves. So the massive shifts we've endured over the last two and a half years have had a lot of consequences. 
they've changed how we've worked for the better, I think. It feels like we've definitely done some more silo breaking over the last few years. And those shifts have changed what we've made, both in terms of digital content, products and experiences, and maybe we have made better stuff as a result that's more finely tuned into what our audiences want and need. But these shifts have had a detrimental impact on our people. We're all running on empty, as I said, and there are fewer of us to do this work. And there's less money to fund the things that we're all supposed to be doing. So to end, here are a few questions I'm still mulling and would love to discuss with you now and over the course of the day. So, how do we continue to collaborate together within and beyond the digital team? How can we make the good ways of working stick? How can we continue to make the most of the good content we already have? At the same time, how do we develop new content formats that respond to different audience needs and interests? We've had funding cuts, and they are definitely more to come. So will we plan, how will we plan and prioritise what we do and what not to do? That's really important. And how much agency do we have in that decision? How do we do, deal with what feels now like constant churn? How do we better support our people? Should we structure our digital teams differently? What roles should remain in-house? What could be outsourced? And how do we upskill others internally to spread the digital load? So to end, let's all try to keep hold of the good stuff. Let's try not to drift back into any bad habits. And let's collectively brace ourselves for the inevitable change that's still to come. Thanks all for listening. through that journey again a little bit. Sorry. Maybe we should put a trigger warning for digital prof professionals and cultural institutions, but uh, thank you very much. Okay, so to questions, we've got just over 10 minutes and I'll try to get through as many as possible before we stop. Um, let's see if anyone has any questions. Or are people just sinking into their seats thinking, okay, how do we move on? Okay, we've got a couple over here. Well, roving mics again. It's a bit of a novelty, isn't it? Hi there, uh, Susie. I'm from the Government Art Collection. Um, I was just wondering, you were talking a lot about uh, reusing or appreciating the work that had already been done, but quite a lot of the examples were of things that had either been created just before the pandemic or during the pandemic. What work did you engage with to, to reuse existing assets that you'd created over kind of the last 10 years? Was there any work that, that really engaged in that? Oh, absolutely. Um, yes, that seems in retrospect slightly contradictory, um, rather than showing you what we did with the old stuff. Um, we had lots of brilliant content on YouTube, and we ended up um, either recutting some of that content and putting out across other social channels, or doing more to think thematically around our collections and our programme, so that we work very closely with the marketing team and the membership team to create, create and map out a series of themes each week, and we would um, identify what content we had to support those themes, and then we were working in a really joined up way to make sure across all our channels, across email marketing, across social and other channels, that we were pushing out um, that content, the existing content, in a much more themed and planned sort of way. And we continue to do that today. Thank you. I'm sure that rings true with many digital professionals, actually, and, and trying to get that coordinated must have mm -hmm. been quite difficult. Mm -hmm. OK, we've got another question. There was a hand up just down here. No. OK, yeah, just in the front. William Clark from the School of Museum Studies, uh, University of Leicester. Um, you, you mentioned when the museum closed physically, 
in some ways it became simpler and there was a primary focus on audience engagement. Uh, my, my research focuses very much on schools-based audiences, but I wonder if you could just tell us all a little bit more about whether there was any uh, segmentation or particular focuses in mind within your team, um, because you've mentioned the audience you know, in a kind of universal sense, but is, is it possible to go into just a little more detail in terms of whether there were thoughts about reaching different kinds of audience? Mm. Great question, thank you. Um, I think this was all down to the fact that we were working in a much more joined up way, that we were thinking about which parts of the organisation uh, had different audience priorities. Uh, across marketing, digital and comms, we were thinking about the large scale online audience and thinking about getting our content out to those audiences. But obviously in other areas of the organisation, for example, in our learning team, they were thinking quite specifically around uh, families and homeschooling and around schools audiences. We ended up deciding not to prioritise schools audiences so much because there were already lots of online destinations for that sort of content and there's somebody homeschooling. There were you know, probably around a top three uh, a number of uh, places online that you would, you would go for that content and the VNA is simply not one of them and so our efforts were better spent on focusing on sort of more mass audience via our social channels. But the learning team created a series um, called Let's Make Wednesdays that were focused on looking at our collections and making content and putting that out through our blog in a serial format so that we could help fuel that appetite for making things at home that was less around formal learning but more around parents and kids working together. Hi. Uh, sorry. Oh, there we go. Oh, oh, that. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I'll yes. continue. So, uh, my name is Diana and I'm from Third Block. Uh, first of all, Katie, thank you for your presentation. It was like, I can see that it was like super honest and uh, it's not a secret that VNA is like one of the most, let's say, industries, uh, I don't know, visionary in the market. And uh, I'm really curious, uh, like talking about NFT and like Web3 space, I know it's like super controversially <laughs> here in this, let's say, hall. But do you have any strategy that you have already decided with your team that you're entering it? What's your, I don't know, like pipeline or you're like just put everything on post? Like what's your personal maybe uh, to like m meaning to Web3 here? Um, I think, I mean, it was interesting. There was a moment where suddenly we had a barrage of requests from people saying, let me help you make some NFTs. And... We kind of held off, and I've got, I've got very specific views, and probably don't have enough time <laughs> to cover it now. That's one for the coffee um, break, maybe. That is definitely one for the coffee break, or maybe the alcohol later. Um, I think we've held off a little bit in terms of thinking about where this all lands, in terms of thinking about what our role should be in terms of NFTs and other things, Web3. Um, I think there's definitely opportunities we want to explore. But I think with it's this is often the case with lots of... Um, Sort of more cutting edge technologies. I don't think it's necessarily museums or cultural organisations place to be at the bleeding edge. I think we need to see things mature a little bit before we start using, for example, taxpayers' money on making some fancy experiments to see what lands and what doesn't. So I think it's more for us a watch and see. Um, certainly do some experiments where we can, but not go in all guns blazing right now. Lots of nods around the room. Up here, yeah. Hello, Katy. Matijn from TPX Impact. Um, lovely presentation, really, really good, insightful. Um, I hear a lot of, uh, and I want to pick up on the theme of, uh, of audiences and audience development. Um, so I, 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 there's a lot of conversations with museums, and I hear that you know we want to do more with CRM and we want to develop audiences. In how much? Well, either have you learned or are you planning to do more than, oh, you've enjoyed this, you know, follow us, sign up for our mailing list, like to really develop audiences so that you, you know, uh, to, in, in the end, maybe, you know, for either financial, mm -hmm. you know, commerce or other, other gains? Um, I think there are probably two strands to the answer to that. Um, one is around uh, thinking about our membership base and um, doing, we're doing a lot of work at the moment to dig into the data and understand much more around how that composition 
has changed massively in the last few years. Um, as an institution that relies a lot on blockbusters as a means to driving membership, uh, the moment you don't have so many blockbusters on your hands, it has an impact on the membership base and composition. Uh, we saw people, for example, that had joined us for exhibitions like uh, Pink Floyd, who were no longer renewing. Um, we've also seen people's behaviours changed as a result of the pandemic. Let's face it, we're all uh, re looking, reconsidering all our subscriptions. Do we need all the Disney Pluses and the Netflixes and the whatnots? You know, we're, we're thinking about how to rationalise and uh, be more economical about these things. So memberships change massively. We need to understand the data a lot more to really uh, see who's going to stick with us and stick through it. How are we going to... Um, make sure we do a good job on retention as well as think about new acquisition strategies and digital will no doubt have a, play, a role to play in acquisition not just tactically but in terms of the proposition itself and then there's audience development in terms of um, our new venues the vna is now a family of venues we have two new venues opening up at vna east in 2024 and 2025 we've got um, the young vna opening up next year in Bethnal Green. So we're thinking about um, how we start targeting very different audiences to those that you typically see walking into South Kensington. That means thinking very specifically about Gen Z um, and younger audiences. And to that end, we're thinking about what our content offer needs to look like to attract those audiences. And we're thinking about um, a lot of internal work, I think, and the pandemic's helped us in this sense to socialize the idea that the end goal isn't always visitation, that online engagement is an end goal in and of itself and to achieve that engagement we need to create content that's really relevant to these audiences who have very different behaviors and appetites to our traditional south kensington audiences so the short answer i'm saying is that we're doing a lot of data analysis on both those fronts <laughs> we may, sorry we may be able to squeeze in a last question apologies in the front here if we go to the back hi Cathy. Uh, my name's george, hi, george. Uh, nice to see you um, I had a question about your internal work practice on, in this pressurised last few years and I wanted to ask whether you had any really positive experiences during that and if you developed any particular tactics or tools that you liked and would like to continue looking forward. Um, I would say that it was much easier when everything was remote um, in that we managed to, we prioritised the um, rollout, the beta launch of Explore the Collections, which is our new collections website for those who don't know it. It was um, a real transformation, not just in terms of user experience, but in terms of data and content and, and all kinds of stuff that Richard can also tell you more about. Um, that, was, that was brilliantly aided by the fact that we weren't spending so much time on tubes and trains. We were basically online all the time together and working at pace and at speed and problem solving really quickly together. And so we ended up fast forwarding, um, moving forward our, our release date. I'm really conscious I've got this pressure of the 11 o'clock, I've got 20 seconds. So that worked really well. What worked less well is when we then entered this hybrid space where some of us are at home, some of us are in the office and that just became a bit more clunky and we're still in that period. So I think it feels to me like it's easier when it's all or nothing, but can talk about the specific tools and the in the break. Okay. Sorry, we've got bang on time. And now, uh, thank you very much. And now, as it's 11 o'clock, please join me in silence for two minutes to pause, breathe, and reflect on the service and sacrifices our services and forces make on our behalf.
Thank you very much. Okay, so uh, can we please thank Carty for the honestly brilliant summary uh, of where we've been and hopefully of a sign of where things are going. Um, and I'm sure Carty's very willing to hang around for a bit and field some extra questions you have during the coffee break, which is now, you'll be glad to hear. But first, join me in a round of applause for our keynote talk. And just a reminder, we'll be starting back at half past 11. So take the opportunity to stretch your legs. Thank you.